Hi. Thank you, Larry, for inviting me here. Um, and thank you also to Carissa and to Mary for helping make this happen. Um, today I'm going to talk about some of the stuff I do in the classroom. Uh, it was a nice sort of intro this morning with our other two speakers talking about uh, how science education has been beaten out of kids. And I think that's exactly correct. Um, and what we end up with at college are a lot of students whose all of their curiosity and, and all of their sort of engagement to learn has been beat out of them. And so that's sort of the struggles that we're facing at the college level, is what's happened to these kids for the 15 years before they come into my classroom. And so I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that we do um, and a little bit about California State University Northridge. And we have about 38,000 students. It's one of the largest in the California State system. And um, we have about 1,800 biology majors. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the stuff that I teach to the majors and a lot about the techniques I use to help teach our non-majors. So that's a big portion of what comes to the university is actually the non-major students, right? And a lot of tenure-track faculty ignore that whole cohort of students. I'm one of the first tenure-track faculty that has taught in our Biology 100 in 20 years, right? That's left to the part-timers, they're not majors, those are the people that we don't, we don't need to spend our time on. And I think that's wrong because those are the people who are the haters. That's, that's how we sort of refer to them, right? They're the haters. They come in that room and they hate science, right? And they hate learning science and they hate me. <laughs> and so what do you do with those people, right? Those are the people that are voting. Right? Who votes for science funding in this country? Yes, we do. Right? Who goes into politics? Not us. Those people. So can we take the 230 people that I sit in a classroom a semester in the non-majors and turn them into science lovers? Mm, maybe one or two. But can you make them not haters? Yes, absolutely, right? Can you change their whole, and guess what else? Those kids in that room are gonna be teaching your kids and your grandkids in the classroom. And if they're science haters, what are they gonna do in that science classroom? Read the textbook and answer some questions. Memorize a whole bunch of stuff, and that's what science is, right? So we wanna change that. So, we particularly have problems in uh, the state system because we lose most of the really good students to the UCs, right, and to the private schools. So the California state system is sort of for everybody else. And as it turns out, about 70% of the students that enroll at the Cal State need remedial math and English upon arrival, okay? We get the really good students too, the ones who don't want to sit in the classroom with 700. Right? or his parents can't afford private school or don't want to. And then a lot of the very culturally diverse students who must live at home. They're not allowed to live outside of their family, and they have lots of family um, requirements, things they must do. And so we do get the really good students too, right? but we have lots of students that are on this huge continuum. Students who are the first to go to college in their family, right? came to this country recently, have a lot of life struggles. Lots of them already have kids of their own, right? That's impossible, okay? So, um, <laughs> so we have this problem, and what we see from what's happened to them, at least lots of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, one of the biggest challenges that we see... <laughs> So we see that, <laughs> right? What do, I, what, what do you do with that? Okay, and so I've come up with, with a couple of uh, my colleagues at CSUN, of ways to, to stop that from happening, or at least try to, right? So we, so we go through lots of antics and things that I think are fun, 
and some of it's to motivate the students, but a lot of it's just to motivate me. Right? The end of the semester, it's been a long semester, and you've got to walk in that room, and you're supposed to be inspiring. <sighs> it, gets, it, it gets exhausting. Right? So some of the stuff that we do is <laughs> it's all about me, and if they enjoy it, then that's just a bonus. Okay? So, you know, I, I think if, if students find learning fun, any kind of learning, you could use this for other things aside from science, right? but especially in science, that they'll be more vo motivated to learn it. Okay? So if they're having some fun, if they think things are exciting, if they're awake, maybe they'll learn something. Okay? And so some of the ideas that I use for making learning fun is humor, try to be funny, we play some in-class games. Some of these work better for non-majors versus majors, so some of them I use in both, some I only use for one or the other. Uh, learning incentives, I think, is a big help. What we have traditionally is just consequences if you don't learn, right? You don't pass the exam, you don't pass the course, you have to retake it and spend all your money, your GPA gets hammered, all of that sort of thing. But I also think there should be some incentives other than just you're, you're going to get an A and that's going to help your GPA. Okay, so we'll, I'll talk about some of those things as well. So, <laughs> as it turns out, I think I'm really funny, but <laughs> not all students agree with me. And so those are my top two favorite quotes from student evaluations. When they fill out the multiple choice and then they have the opportunity to comment, these are two of my favorites that uh, come up. So I spend a lot of time making fun of myself or science or scientists or, or what, anything that can get them to not just be sleeping in the classroom. And sometimes if... Oh my. And sometimes if I'm not funny, but I think I'm funny, I'll laugh, and then they laugh at me because I'm laughing at something that's not funny at all. So... <laughs> That also works. And so I'm going to show you some stuff and try to be funny. <laughs> so <laughs> we try to be unpredictable, okay? And especially in the non-majors and even in the majors classroom, what they expect from a science professor is somebody who's going to be very serious and they're going to talk and they're going to just jam some data and details down their throats and you're going to be very serious because science is a big serious and we're saving the world and so forth. And so if we step out of that role a little bit, students are more engaged, okay? And so the more you fit the stereotype, the more unpredictable you can be. So for myself, I lose the unpredictability within the first week, because they come to expect me to do something ridiculous, right? But for other professors that have tried this sort of thing, it works remarkably well because they would never expect a certain kind of off-color joke from certain faculty members, right? Or the use of slang language, or some sort of um, using an example from YouTube, or, so, or some pop culture thing that they would never think we'd know anything about, right? So that, that is really helpful as well. Okay. So we'll just look at this for a second. Alan! Al! Alan! <laughs> I don't think you can hear me now. Alan! 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 Al! Alan! 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 No, it's not Alan. Steve. Steve! 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 Did someone just say my name? Hey, 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 hey. You say Alan. Okay, so that kind of stuff has nothing to do with what we're talking about in class. So if we're teaching transcription and translation or something that's full of details and they're dying, and then you just put that up there and they laugh, ha ha. And then later in class, when they're all sleeping, I'll just go, Alan, Alan, Alan. And then somebody will yell, that's not Alan. <laughs> and then I know they're with me, right? At least one person. So, and then you can... <laughs> and then you can use that the rest of the semester. Just randomly sometime, you just start, Alan, Alan! 
right? And, and then just move on. And so those are the kinds of things that sort of bring them back. You know, an hour and 15 minutes to sit and listen to, especially, I mean, I love transcription, right? Don't get me wrong. But it kills them. Right, all the details and all the mechanisms and where did this go and which polymerase came in when and you know, all of that kind of stuff. And so we just add this kind of stuff for fun and totally not educational. And then I have some examples where I use a video that is educational. And a lot of these come from songs or videos because if, if you think about things you remember, I bet you can remember the lyrics of a song you learned when you were a little kid. And you could probably sing that whole song from 30 years ago, 40 years ago, right? And so if you put some science content to music and make it a little bit funny, then students might remember stuff. And this really works well for the non-majors, right? Who it's really all, everything they learn in that room is a foreign language. And so it's really hard for them to put stuff together. And so there's plenty of resources out um, online, things you can make yourself. There's just tons of stuff out there. This is a, an actual commercial. So this is not something that we did, but it's a, um, a commercial for BioRad, actually. Okay. Six years of graduate school, and look at our boy now. Oh, Randolph. Now, I remember somebody that wasn't too different from this not too long ago. the scientists out there doing PCR, BioRad salutes you with the all-new line of so fast super mixes for real-time PCR. All right. Okay, so that's one of the things that we do that's not really serious. And so I ask the students if they want to sing along, they can dance along, right? The little kids in grade school always want to jump out of their seat. And they're told their whole lives, sit down, raise your hand, don't talk. And then in college, when I want them to jump out of their seats, right, jump up and shout out the answer, oh, they're all just sitting there, right? So we try to get them up. If it's in the middle of a class that they've been sitting there, I would have loved to have the opportunity to stand up in the middle of a classroom, especially, you know, if you had a rough night the night before. And so then we use silly examples. This is a little... Um, video that I'm going to play, and i got to make sure I don't screw this up, uh, okay, that I use, you can use in pretty much all of our classrooms. We try to teach the scientific method every time we have the opportunity to talk to students, and so I've used this when we go to do uh, high school outreach. You can use this with little kids, you can use it with college students, and you sort of talk about what is the scientific method, and like our speaker said before, all kids are born scientists. 
And I try to tell them that, right, what, it's curiosity. It's wanting to answer questions. It's wanting to figure stuff out, right? And so here would be an example. What does the scientist do? We watch stuff. We go out, see how things work, and then try to figure out why or how or where or what. And so if we, we're looking at a little video, and we might wonder what this bird is up to, right? Like, what on earth could he be doing, right? And so then we talk about, well, what are all the things we already know about birds and so forth? So we might say, you know, talk about a hypothesis. What's the hypo possible hypothesis? Well, we know, or at least lots of people know, that there are mating dances that birds do to attract mates, right? The blue-footed booby shows his feet to the chicks to see if he can get some action, right? And so we might say, well, that, maybe that's what this bird is doing, right? Maybe it's a mating ritual and that's what he's up to. And then what do you have to do? You have to do the actual experiment. So you send a whole bunch of graduate students out there to watch all these birds and see if they get action or not, whether they're doing the dance. And then you have to come up with a conclusion. You go through the whole scientific method. Okay? And then you say, but this, so, and after all of this work, this is what we found out. Nighttime. Daytime! Nighttime. Daytime! Daytime! What are you doing? I'm in a game of nighttime, daytime. You want to play? No, you're right. I got an Xbox. <laughs> right, and so then we talk about, oh, sorry. <laughs> so then we talk about science isn't always what you expect to find, and we've learned that throughout this conference as well. And then you can talk about all the ramifications and blah, blah, blah. And then generally I tell them that bird is actually hunting. Okay, so what they actually find out is he makes the shadow and then the little fish come to hide in the shadow, they think it's safe, and then he eats them. Okay, and so that's really what that bird was up to. Although daytime, nighttime was a lot more fun than that. <laughs> so, okay. So aside from, and there's a billion videos out there. I could spend hours showing you all the stuff that I have that, you know, you use once in a while. It depends on uh, what you're teaching. Um, and then we also play some games in class, also for classroom engagement. Try to get them involved in the classroom, or at least just be awake, even if they really don't care what you're talking about. Um, so one of the games we play is, I actually got from a parenting book, and it's called the yes-no game. And so the idea is, any time that I say the word yes, the students have to yell no in my face. And so that makes people feel better because they get to yell no in a professor's face. Right? And so with parents and kids, you're supposed to do that with your child, especially if they're being difficult or obstinate. They, it's a game where they get to yell no in your face, and it's okay, they don't get sent to their room. Right? And so if I'm teaching some things, everybody know why complimentary base pairing happens. Yes? No! Right, and then they yell no. And then sometimes I forget the game, and I'll just use the word yes at some point, and they yell no. And then that, that's how it works. And you can do that throughout the semester, if you're bored, you see everybody sleeping, you know, you know, everybody's listening to me, yes? No. Right, and they yell no. Okay. Okay. And then, <laughs> then you really don't know if anybody's listening to you, but whatever. So the next game we play is called Secret Word of the Day, and this is from an old TV show, and I'll show you a clip for that. And this one can either be just to goof off, or it can be actually educational, okay? And so the secret word of the day, um, I can offer clues to the students through our online um, classroom management system where we can post lectures and tell them what's going on. And so you can post a clue for what the secret word of the day is, and they'd have to figure out by reading the chapter what the answer is and, and what that clue is. And then um, I'll show you this little clip of how it works. So I figured instead of me explaining it, we'll actually just have... Thanks, my tower. name's Sherry. Don't wear it out. Amy, I have a question. What's that? What's today's secret word? Ooh, interesting question. Let's go with our skunky. Conky 3000. Ready to assist you for the book of Pee Wee. Good morning, Conky. Hey, what's today's secret word? Today's secret word is. 
Now you all remember what to do whenever anyone says a Z word, right? <laughs> that is so correct. For the rest of the day, whenever anybody says a Z word, scream really loud. Ready? Let's try it. Hey, Jerry, how's it going? I'm having fun! <laughs> Everybody, really fun. Okay, so we can use this again to get people into the class. So if the clue was something about DNA polymerase, right, I put it online a couple days before, and then in the classroom, the first time I say it, people might scream. And if they don't, then I get really mad at them and I tell them I'm never playing games with them again, right? <laughs> so you can come up with any secret word. Sometimes if I forget I've done it, and I totally forget to say the actual word, a student will raise their hand and ask a question using the word, and then the other people around them start screaming. Okay, so that works really well. And so, <laughs> so along with that, I sort of work into, you know, everybody knows some mnemonics for remembering things, and so it might be part of one of those mnemonics that the secret word of the day is. And so I might post online that the secret word of the day is kinky. Right? And so it needs to be something you're not going to say a hundred times. You need to say it once or twice during the lecture so that they're not just screaming the entire time, or they'll get really tired and then that'll put them to sleep too. But, and I use that for when I'm teaching Kingdom Phylum Class Order Family Genus Species. Because even the majors, especially in the non-majors, they can't remember the order of classification. So Kingdom Phylum Class Order Family Genus Species. And so the mnemonic for that is kinky people come over for good sex. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so all students remember that. And then when you say kinky, then ah, they all have to yell as well. Right? So that works to being somewhat fun, somewhat educational, and just you know, keeping everybody awake. OK. <laughs> One of my other favorite things to do is a class sing-along. So I'm going to ask you guys to join in today. So I know the. The speakers in our lecture hall are a lot louder and it helps drown me out because I cannot sing at all, which is part of why it's funny. Um, and so in the upper right is going to be a video that shows uh, a classroom where we did a sing-along and then on the lower left is going to actually be a video that one of my colleagues made, Dr. Mary Pat Stein, who put it together with the words um, to make it a little more educational than us just dancing around. And so we do have a karaoke program that we, can <laughs> that we can use, but not all the projectors work with it. And so the day that we had this little sing-along, we were having technical difficulties. So we just had the lyrics of the song posted in PowerPoint on the, on the screens. And my classroom, the cell and tissue culture class, which is about 25 students, came down to the cell biology class to, we, they, we were, they were the backup singers and dancers for the classroom. And so that we're gonna see, so I'm gonna see if I can get the sound off of this one. There we go. And this one has a little delay because we had some technical difficulties. And then this one will have the music to it. So please feel free to sing along. I need you for glycolysis. <laughs> my muscles take you in. All it takes is a little bit of insulin. Chasing me, all glucose, 
pure and aldehyde sugar And you're sweeter than a woman's kiss Cause I need you for black collar sis I just can't believe the way my muscles break you down My glycogen is almost gone A few more seconds and I'll be regurgitated Acidosis does me wrong you're sweet as turning sour, baby I'm losing all my power, baby I'm gonna make your muscles ache No, no, no I'm swimming in a lactate, baby Oh, yeah I'm swimming in a lactate, baby Now I'm drowning in a lactate, baby I'm gonna make your muscles ache No, no, no I'm swimming Oh, sugar, sugar I used you up and you left me flat Now I'll have to get my kicks from fat Oh, oh glucose Sugar, 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 sugar. The <laughs> <laughs> all right now what all right more sing-alongs i can't sing this one because it's too high for me because i'm a baritone um, but i'm going to show this one is written by another professor at csun cheryl van buskirk and in this one you can well the the sound in here is not as loud as it could be but you can hear the students singing along with the song so especially for the refrain part the rest of it, they're not so hip on. But um, this is actually in the non-majors, so. And there's me dancing along, because I can't sing. are really good for students because during the exams you can see them singing it in their head because they need to keep track of which is a tumor suppressor what does that one do what does an oncogene do and the glucose song everybody knows glycolysis produces atp and all, you know that sort of stuff so so those songs work even if that's all they learn they do get something from some of this crazy stuff <laughs> random yeah videos uh, <laughs> So a lot of this stuff is geared at getting the unmotivated student motivated, and the motivated students enjoy it as well. But I, I always thought it's so unfair that we have a plus minus system that doesn't allow us to give an A plus, right? If a student gets a 91%, they get the same grade as if they get a 99% in a classroom. And that always irritated me as an undergraduate. And so now that I have the power, I decided to do something about the A students who, who really have the potential to be the A plus students, or the 100%, or go all out. But what's their motivation to work harder and spend more time if they're getting the same grade anyways, right? And so what we do in the classrooms is in um, the, the upper division and the majors classrooms, the top two students at the end of the semester do not have to take the comprehensive final exam. And so the, those students compete through the semester to be number one and number two, because then they don't have to study for the final, they don't have to come take the final, right? And if you're a senior with senioritis in the spring and you're about to graduate, 
and you're taking cell biology or genetics or some other recombinant DNA technology, that's a huge deal for them, right? And so then that bumps their hovering at 92, 93, they're up at 99, they're going for every possible point they can in the classroom. And so that really makes a difference for those really good students, right? Who might be bored when I continue to hammer the basics, right? Complementary base pairing, uh, you know, to the rest of the students. So they still have some motivation to take that little step even farther. We also have, or I also have the 100% rule, and that's if students in one of the upper division majors classes earns 100% on an exam, like every single point without any bonuses or extra baloney, that I will dress up in a clown suit and juggle for them <laughs> in the classroom. And <laughs> so generally that happens at least once a semester. Okay, so I'll show you a little clip of that. And then we also have creative projects. And this was sort of came up from the songs that, you know, the, a whole CD of songs where, you know, the Greg Crowther took regular songs and made science content to them. And we said, well, why can't we do that too? Why can't our students do that? Why can't they have something that they need to learn a bunch of content and then do something creative with? And so the first time we tried it, we tried it in a large lecture hall, and it was a disaster. Because you can't evaluate 150 people's poems and songs and videos and so forth. So that was a little out of control. And so what it came down to is, um, Dr. Stein and I, we, de we decided it, it can only be in a small classroom that it works the best. And so she designed it around her immunology class. And so the creative projects are worth about 10% of their grade. There has to be lots of scientific content and so forth. And so I'll show you some of those. And then we also have some in-class assessment, which I probably won't have time to talk about. But it's sort of like the clicker systems. I know at CU they have the clicker systems. You can see the signs on the walls where students can answer multiple choice questions or, or easy sort of short answer questions in the classroom as you're teaching to sort of see where everybody stands. So here's, this one's real short, so it won't take too long. So this is a student who got an A, 100% uh, on the first um, genetics exam. And so I had to come in and dress up like a clown and juggle for them. <laughs> So you never know somebody's hidden talents that they learned in middle school, you know, might come back to help them in their career. So, and, and man, students were so motivated to get me in a clown suit that more motivated than I even thought. I thought, what a, it's not like I'm going to be embarrassed. I don't know why I thought that was such a big deal. <laughs> so, <laughs> all about dressing up in a costume. Okay. And so then that same, one of the same semesters, that was the first exam, that same student got 100% on the second exam, even though I made it harder than any other second exam I'd ever written because I was, you know. So I said, well, I can't dress up in a clown again. I mean, I could, but whatever, we've already done that. And so at lunchtime right before that, we decided to make up a little song and do a sing-along for them. And so we, uh, one of my favorite uh, <laughs> singer-songwriters is Neil Diamond, right? And he's right in my, the right sort of, tone for me, he doesn't sing too high for me. And so we, we wrote a song, we were, I, I was teaching uh, molecular crossing over in that classroom, and so we made up a quick little song, and again, we had technical difficulties with our karaoke, so um, we sort of set the words and danced and sang for them. This was one of the first times we did it in the classroom before we were doing the glucose song. <laughs> So this is a little clip of that. So that's Dr. Stein. And then we couldn't remember the words either while we were singing. Because we just wrote it. Touching strands, reaching out, invading me, invading you, sweet crossing over. <laughs> the students in the doorway are like, what the hell is going on here? 
<laughs> That's the best part right there. <laughs> so I think this is one that one of the ones that Larry saw, which is why I got invited here. So uh, <laughs> Okay, so let's see, what else? Oh, so this is a Creative Pot project. Here's some examples uh, that students came up with. And so they've made stuffed animals. So this is sort of a little prelude for our next talk. There's a nice little T-cell stuffed animal up there. They made a dendritic cell to go with it and a B-cell. Um, there's kids' books. So they're all about teaching content, right? And what's the best way students learn is if they can actually teach it. Right? You can't know something unless you can, if you can get that information across to somebody else, you really know it. And so they have to take some concept and then they make some sort of fun creative project out of it. And so this helps students who are not the linear thinking memorizers, right? The people who can use other things, the artists, the musicians, and so forth. And so we've had a whole bunch of um, different creative projects. The next one is one of my favorites. I won't, this one's really long, but this is just amazing um, from one of our students, Tamika, that put this together. She's now in medical school. And I just wanted to play a little of this because it it's, takes a really complicated system and does something really amazing. So this is a, a, a pretty long song. I want to show you one last thing real quick. Um, I don't think it'll work in here, but we could try it. So this is the clicker system that I use in the classroom. So we do have the regular clickers where students have to buy a device, and then they can answer questions. Our students hate it, just despise it. The, the device is 60 to $80. They constantly forget it. They don't bring it to class. or one student brings 10 clickers with them because it, it tracks attendance, right, and gives them points for that. And so they'll sit in that seat and they have 10 clickers and they're logging every, all their friends in. And then they take turns coming to class and so forth. So the system that I like to use actually uses cell phones. So it uses the students' cell phones or computers. If it's a smartphone or a computer, they can go right to the, into that website and answer questions that way. If they don't, they text message. And so they text message in the, the answers. Um, it gives you the phone number to call. And then we can see a report of what the right answer is. And then we can talk about whatever that question happened to be. So usually it's something in the middle that's either historically confusing or something that I want to make sure they actually got the point of. Right? And so then we can go back and talk about that after um, we get the results from those. And we usually, you know, it takes a little bit of time but we usually only do a couple um, questions, and it gives them a little bit of <laughs> it gives them a little bit of extra points, motivates them to come into the classroom because they get points essentially for sitting there and just texting in a message to us. And so then, since I'm just about out of time, I just wanted to uh, thank my family. This is an old picture, but it's one of the few that I have a picture of the esteemed Dr. Titel in a bear costume, and. Um, the rest of them are faculty members that are on board with all this buffoonery that we do in the classroom and a lot of these ideas 
um, usually come up at lunchtime when we're having lunch together to do things like this in the classroom. And then, uh, just quickly, I also run a small research lab at CSUN with undergraduates and master's students, and these are some of my students um, that help keep me sane. And then I also run the Bridges program, uh, that's California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, funded for students of 10 a year to go to UCLA to do stem cell research and get trained in that sort of thing. And so thank you for your fun. <laughs>